So the next thing to talk about are space sickness. So these are the psychophysiological concerns. So half psychology, half um, physiological. Space sickness, sleep deprivation. We're going to talk about some stages of psychological adaptation to space. So what are some stages that people usually go through when they are adapting to space? And then uh, finally, I'll we'll show you some stats from uh, some emotional balance studies. So here are some of the main characteristics of uh, space motion sickness. And I didn't know a lot of this stuff before I did research on this. So the onset is usually one to two hours after exposure to microgravity. So it's not something that hits you immediately when you get into space, but soon thereafter. So you may get into space, oh yay, I'm fine, I don't get uh, space sickness. And you actually do an hour later. There's also cases of delayed onset more than 24 hours uh, after you've been in space. Uh, the duration is usually one to three days and occasionally up to seven days. Can you imagine being space sick on your first mission for seven days. The symptoms are malaise, loss of appetite, stomach awareness, in case you're just very careful of your stomach. Uh, brief and sudden vomiting, often without um, prodromal nausea, so it's like you're unaware that you're going to vomit and then it's all over the place. Uh, flushing or less often pallor, so changes in skin color. Uh, nausea, lack of initiative, impaired concentration of drowsiness. So the incidence rate of this is actually uh, pretty high. 44 to 67 percent of astronauts get this on their first flight, and up to 85 percent of less trained non-crew astronauts um, do get space sickness. So people who maybe aren't as familiar with uh, flying, although they found that it's not too much difference between pilots and non-pilots for the space sickness. And it goes down for second flights? Yeah, it goes down for second flights. I don't have a stat there for you, but you can become a little bit accustomed to it. But look at that first first mission instance, right? At least half or more of astronauts are going to get space sickness. Okay. Uh, provoking factors, fast movements of the head and body, and some countermeasures that they use are uh, pre flight training to familiarize astronauts with the kind of vestibular situation, sensory complex rising from altered vestibular input space. So basically, the human gyroscope, if you've seen that. Um, flying in the bottom of comic doing travels on that. And also, um, some biofeedback training to uh, get control of what about other responses. And they also take medication for this as well. The problem with the medication is that it can cause uh, drowsiness and cognitive defects or deficits. So. You don't want to be taking medicine to deal with your motion sickness. That's going to reduce your cognitive ability to perform some sort of complex uh, task without the space arm or something like that. The next one is talking about some sleep. Uh, this is, I think, from the shuttle. Um, the number of hours of sleep that astronauts get on each day of their mission, and for comparison, the amount of time they had sleeping on the ground was 7.9 hours, so on the ground they're almost fully rested. Most adults, or adult males, need between 7 to 8 hours of sleep per night. Adult females need between 6 to 7 hours of sleep per night. So if they're doing a uh, single shift, which means you know, typically about 10 hours or so, or double shift for longer, uh, we'll get, see, you can see like, this here and here, around a 6 hours for the entire week, and same for the uh, double shift. So, you're getting significantly less sleep than what you get on the ground. And one to two hours sleep losses results in lower cognitive performance. So, people are getting lower cognitive performance because of the sleep loss. Three days is insufficient time to regain proper sleep. So, typically on the last day of a shuttle mission, we'll have a pretty easy day before they do re entry. But still, the research says that even three days isn't enough time to kind of get back your, your sleep losses. So, you're having people re-enter re a space vehicle, having to fly a space vehicle down to the ground that have cognitive performance deficits. And 50% of dual shift astronauts reported using sleep medications on orbit. So not only are you having people who have um, a lack of sleep, but they're also on medications. So is that just uh, some different like, space sickness? Do you have trouble sleeping? It can result, because part of the space sickness is Part of the space sickness one was uh, uh, drowsiness. I think there's also some issues of, of sleeping, but it doesn't seem there. 
But the, this is the result of just workload and other factors on workload. And, and just being um, comfortable sleeping in a, in a different environment than you're used to, right? Because you're just floating there, arms kind of shift up. So let's look at some stages of adaptation now. Uh, these are the four different stages that astronauts go through. And what really shocks you is in the middle of this, you have a period of complete adaptation. Okay? So you start off stage one, you get to orbit, you have decreased work capability, vestibular discomfort, and acute period of adaptation of microgravity. So acute period is a, a short but severe period of, uh, where you're adapting to the microgravity. Then you have a second uh, period of complete adaptation. So you have no problems, you're great, you feel, wow, I can really do this stuff in orbit, no problems. And then you get into stage three where you start having sleep disturbances, you have a narrowed sphere of interest, decreased activity, uh, irritability, and fatigue fixation, and a period of aesthetic state of nervous of the nervous system. Remember we said that the aesthetic state was um, very low energy, so you just don't feel like you have the energy to do things. And then finally, stage four, you have excitation, agitation, lack of self-control, and a sense of euphoria. Yes? How long are each of these stages? Uh, this is during a five-month space mission. Uh, I don't have the exact figures here for you. But like, is stage two like relatively, like is it like a month in the middle, or do you just go? Yeah, ahead? yeah, it's, it's about that, that length, um, about a month, month and a half. And then you start slowly getting the onset of these different stage symptoms. So and then finally, like, at the very end of your mission, at the very end of your mission, you're starting to get some uh, kind of all over the place, right? Ex excitation, but you're getting agitated, you have a lack of self-control, uh, lack of your emotional control, so you might start snapping at your fellow astronauts at the end of your mission, and also a sense of euphoria. And so you feel that sometimes really good, and sometimes really bad. To further illustrate this point, here is a um, study from Mir, and this was only conducted on one astronaut, so there isn't really um, external validity to this particular study. Right? So you can't say, this happens to all astronauts, but this happened to one particular astronaut, or cosmonaut, on Mir. You can see that, um, you can't see it on here, the first stage is pre-flight, the second stage is uh, the first month, fourth month, seventh, ninth, eleventh, the fourteenth, these are all those months at the Mir station, fourteen months altogether, and then post-flight. So you can see, uh, he's pretty, pretty, you know, his emotional awareness, emotional balance, he's pretty even at the very start, before he launches into space. As soon as he gets to space, he's got a huge drop in his emotional balance and alertness, which seems to last for most of the first month, and then he starts to feel better after the first month. Feels pretty good for most of his uh, second to 14th month in space, so he's kind of adapted to the situation there, he's accepted his circumstances, and then finally, when he returns uh, after his flight, flight post-flight, he starts getting this down period again. Okay? So you can imagine someone uh, goes to space, they are uh, have a drop in emotional balance at the start, then they adjust to it, they're fine throughout the rest of the mission, and then after they get back, they start feeling some um, a different uh, drop in emotional balance. Okay? Here on the other hand is uh, sadness, so it's a measure of how uh, sad this guy is. You can see before he launches, he's kind of sad, and he's getting happy right before the launch. He's a little, mostly sad for his first month, and then he's kind of down and up and down and up uh, throughout his flight. So he's getting the ups and downs of his space flight, and then finally when he returns, he's got a period of ups and downs as well. How do they measure these? Like, you see these uh, questionnaires. Would you, There's different, like, um, wouldn't your emotional alertness affect how you score your sadness? Uh, it could. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's talk now about some true.